Hey, welcome to our YouTube live. And we're happy to have uh, Dr. Ian Lugin with us this afternoon. And he's going to speak on the topic, uh, the goodness of God's design for marriage. Uh, he'll uh, speak to us for the first uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And afterwards, we'll entertain uh, questions from the audience as well from uh, the student body. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by reading two passages from the Song of Songs. Uh, Song of Songs chapter 4 verse 8 through 5 verse 1, and then Song of Songs chapter 8 verses 5 through 7. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the peak of Amana, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have captured my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captured my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful your love is, my sister, my bride. Your love is much better than wine, and the fragrance of your perfume than any balsam. Your lips drip sweetness like the honeycomb, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. My sister, my bride, you are a locked garden, a locked garden and a sealed spring. Your branches are a paradise of pomegranates, with choicest fruits, Henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all, all the trees, myrrh and aloes, with all the best spices. You are a garden spring, a well of flowing water streaming from Lebanon. Awaken, north wind. Come, south wind, blow on my garden and spread its fragrance of its spices. Let my love come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spices. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, friends. Drink. Be intoxicated with love. And then from chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on the one she loves? I awakened you under the apricot tree. There your mother conceived you. There she conceived and gave you birth. Set me as a seal on your heart, a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Ardent love, as unrelenting as Sheol. Love's flames are fiery flames, the fiercest of all. Mighty waters cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If a man were to give all his wealth for love, it would be utterly scorned. What is love? And what does love have to do with marriage? And what do both of those have to do with the Song of Songs? Well, there are plenty of, of uh, potential answers to the question about love and marriage in the world of popular culture. One quote that I particularly like is by Bruce Lee. Yes, that Bruce Lee, the master of martial arts. He said this, love is like a friendship caught on fire. In the beginning, a flame, very pretty, often hot and fierce, but still only light and flickering. As love grows older, our hearts mature and our love become as coals, deep burning and unquenchable. Now, I don't know if Bruce Lee ever read the Bible, but his image of friendship caught on fire is a good uh, description of the kind of love described in the Song of Songs. Uh, yet as well as the excitement and delight of love, there are also warnings in the song as well. Fire is very pretty, but coals can burn as well as warm. And so too throughout the song, the most glorious descriptions of love stand side by side with stern warnings against stirring up love too soon. And in the Song of Songs, in chapter 8, as we reach the poetic climax of the song, the glory and the pain of love are once again starkly portrayed side by side in a series of distinct but related images. Are love and marriage good? Well, yes, but the Bible affirms clearly the goodness of God's design for marriage. But at the same time, it also warns us about the challenges that marriage presents us as we live in a fallen world. It shows us a positive, powerful portrayal of what marriage can and should look like. A picture of one man and one woman bonded together permanently into a single unit. Two people who become one flesh forever. But who can live up to such a glorious, beautiful picture? Which of our marriages bears more than the faintest resemblance to this glorious model? Is our own personal experience of love and marriage beautiful? Well, for some of us, the answer is yes, but there would have to be qualifications. 
For many people, though, the pursuit of love and marriage has been a long way from this beautiful ideal picture. We are broken people living in a broken world. But the scripture presents us with this positive picture of marriage as a primary metaphor for the relationship that Christ shares with his people. As a result, whether you are single or married or widowed or divorced, in other words, whether you personally have had a positive or a negative experience of love and marriage, God's perfect design for marriage is a design that should captivate all of us. If you're a Christian here, you are part of Christ's bride. This is the ultimate good design that God has for marriage, a design that brings glorious hope to broken and forlorn sinners like us. Hope not just for human flourishing in this world, but for a glorious eternity that is yet to come. Our marriage to Christ is a beautiful reality with no negatives, none of the reservations that inevitably cloud human interactions. Now the primary source that we're going to look at today will be these two passages from the Song of Songs. And obviously these are not the only places we could have gone to in the scriptures to talk about God's good design for marriage. We could have started in Genesis 2. We could have gone straight to Ephesians 5 and Paul's teaching on the subject. And of course, Proverbs has a great deal to say on the subject of marriage. But I think perhaps the Song of Songs is the fullest and most extended reflection on the beauty and goodness of God's design for marriage, and so that's where we're going to spend our time today. Now, I'm assuming here, of course, that the Song of Songs speaks to our human desire for love and marriage, that it's not merely intended to be an allegory about Christ and the church. I'm not going to rehearse my arguments for that position. Uh, I've written on that uh, both in print and there are talks on the internet on that subject if you want to hear more about that. But today I'm, I'm assuming that the song is a poetic description of the love between an idealized man and woman with all of the ups and downs that go with that state in this fallen world. But at the same time, precisely in its character as wisdom literature, it is a word from God that points us onward to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. Now, the first thing to notice about the song is that it delights in marriage and not merely in celebrating sex. It's not coincidental that in that poem I read in chapter 4, verse 8 through 5, 1, which stands at the very center of the book, the same number of verses before and after it, is uh, where we see this relationship finally consummated. That is where the man calls the woman bride for the first time. That word occurs no fewer than six times in this short poem and nowhere else in the book, emphatically connecting together the sexual experience described here with the legal status that accompanies it. Now, bright here can hardly be a metaphor. In what context would an unmarried couple use that term as a metaphor in any culture, ancient or modern? Elsewhere in the Bible, this Hebrew word always indicates the new familial bond that is brought into existence through marriage. And its use here in the song marks a key turning point in the couple's relationship. Marriage creates the legal and relational context in which our sexuality belongs. It provides the setting in which it is right and appropriate for the locked garden to be unlocked, for the sealed fountain to be unsealed. And that unique, lifelong, committed aspect of the couple's love is confirmed by the unremitting imagery used in Song of Songs 8. Love, the song says, is not merely as strong as an ox or as powerful as a speeding locomotive. It is as strong as death. Just as people who enter the grip of death don't emerge again, so too, having entered the equally powerful realm of love, the woman wants that love to grip them both forever. She wants their relationship to remain exclusive and unique, as unyielding and relentless in its single-minded jealousy as the parallel image of Sheol or of the grave. Death doesn't take bribes. You can't buy more life, time for life by distracting the grave's attention. And just as the grave never loses its single-minded focus on swallowing people up, so too, the poet says, is the woman's unrelenting jealousy. Now, we often think of jealousy as a negative emotion, a refusal to share things that ought to be shared. 
Perhaps we get jealous if somebody is getting the attention that we think we deserve. Or if somebody else acquires something that we really desire. As parents, we spend a lot of time and effort teaching our children not to be jealous, but to share. You need to let your little brother play with your toys. You need to rejoice when your sister gets the present that you wish you had got at Christmas time. Uh, I remember one Christmas when I was probably about seven or eight, uh, I received from my great aunt a, a model ship out of plastic that you had to build while well, my sisters were given these adorable stuffed animals. And I was really jealous and I threw a fit that destroyed the whole of Christmas. Uh, that happens, doesn't it? But there are some things in life that are not meant to be shared. You know, when our kids were small, they, they were kind of cute. But if you had come to my wife and I and asked if you could buy them, or if you could borrow them and raise them for a couple of years, we would have said no. We were jealous for our kids. We were conscious that God had given us a unique calling to raise them. And we wouldn't share that with other people. In the same way, there's an appropriate jealousy within marriage. You belong uniquely to that other person, and they belong uniquely to you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be together for every second of the day and never speak to members of the opposite sex without your spouse's permission. We were never intended to meet all the relational needs of our spouses, and it would be folly to try. But loving somebody means that you have a unique relationship with your spouse in which they hold your heart in their hands in a special way that no one else shares. No one else should know your struggles in the way your spouse does. No one else should delight in your triumphs and joys in the way that they do. Some things were not meant to be shared. And love belongs in this permanent, exclusive relationship of marriage. But the couple's bond in the song is not merely a legal one. It is also an affectionate bond of companionship. In this poem, she is not merely his bride. She is his sister. Now, this is where the language of the poem does turn metaphorical. It uses a term of endearment that was well known in ancient Near Eastern love poetry. She is not literally his sister. That would be kind of creepy. Rather, that word indicates a kind of friendship uh, in their marriage like that between a brother and a sister, which was the closest bond possible with a person of the opposite gender in the ancient world. It is a reminder that legal and sexual union were never intended to exist by themselves. When the man and the woman in Genesis 2.24 become one flesh in that original marriage, it indicates much more than mere physical intimacy. It is a union of body and soul in which two people are united in every aspect of their lives. From then on, there are no more two separate individuals, but one new body in which mutual care and companionship and respect and self-giving are the logical consequence, as Paul unpacks in Ephesians 5. But while the relationship of the couple in the song is more than sexual, it's certainly not less than sexual. When the Puritan commentator Matthew Henry advised us to read the Song of Songs as if we didn't have bodies, he was asking us to ignore the obvious. The man in these poems passionately craves the woman as she does him. Her first words in the, bo in the book do not express a longing to share an inductive Bible study with her husband-to-be, but rather a request for him to kiss her with the kisses of his mouth. And in the central poem, he returns a compliment. When she says in chapter 1, verse 2, your love is better than wine, the Hebrew word for love here is better translated caresses. There's no question about the kind of love she has in view. It is a sexual love. Well, so too in this poem in chapter 4, the bride joyfully responds to the man's words of praise and commitment by inviting him to come into her garden to enjoy its choice fruits. The locked garden, the sealed fountain of her body, is now finally freely and eagerly opened for him to enjoy. An awakened paradise that now wafts abroad its fragrance. And the man is equally eager to accept her invitation. He calls her my garden. The myrrh and the spices, the honeycomb and the honey, the wine and the milk that he described in the previous verses now belong to him and to him alone to enjoy. 
And at that moment of consummation, he describes her once again as my sister, my bride, expressing that delightful relational and legal intimacy that provides the appropriate context for sexual intimacy that they are going to share. And at this climactic and central moment of the poem, the author adds his own words of approval. Eat, friends. Drink. Be drunk with love. He is declaring the consummation of their marriage very good, just as God did in the beginning. So what do these beautiful poems have to teach us about love and marriage in our sex-saturated society? Well, to begin with, it clearly holds out as the ideal remaining chaste before marriage and monogamous within marriage. Now, this is, of course, the church's traditional teaching, but this picture is so far from what many people in our culture believe that it is worth underlining. Sex is for marriage and for marriage alone. And marriage is for one man and one woman. That is how God created it in the first place in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And it remains how it should be forever and ever. Amen. But at the same time, the way in which the song argues for this position is different from the way in which the church often argues for chastity and monogamy. Very often, we end up talking in the negative. When people ask us questions, we focus on all of the thou shalt nots of scripture, all of the prohibitions against adultery and lust and homosexual sex and casual divorce and so on and so on. Now those commands are no less biblical than this beautiful portrait. And it is certainly appropriate for our churches to teach clearly that lust and premarital sex and adultery and homosexual sex and unbiblical divorce are wrong. But alongside that, if we're going to be true to the biblical witness, we also need to show people the glorious attractiveness of what biblical marriage was intended to be. This passage is, if you like, God's eat freely of all the trees of the garden that accompanies and precedes the prohibition, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. See, God is not against sex. God invented sex with all of the intense physical and emotional pleasures that it brings. God deliberately designed all of the intricate organs and nerves and blood vessels that make sex so enticing. But he invented it not as a freestyle sport, but as a powerful bonding agent within the marital relationship, in which the legal and relational bonds that are designed to support it are there as well. It is the sister bride whose God and the man desires to enter. And these three aspects of the marital relationship, the legal, the affectionate, and the sexual, are designed to belong together. Remove any one, and you have a deformed relationship. Now, that's not hard to see if you think about it. For example, if you remove the affectionate component from the relationship, as many traditional cultures do, you can have legal marriage and sex without love and intimacy. At its worst, that's legalized rape. But even at its best, it is a travesty of what marriage and sex were designed to be. A selfish exercise in sexual conquest, in which one person uses another person to achieve their own ends. Now, it's perhaps easy for us to see that that's a deformed relationship, since in the West we have a very different view of marriage. But in our culture, we also have plenty of sex without love and intimacy, or legal marriage. Casual hooking up with somebody you just met when you have no intention of getting to know them or getting married to them. And the same is true, of course, of the widespread use of pornography and romantic fantasy literature. When you fantasize sexually about an actor or an actress or about a boy or a girl you know, there's neither a legal relationship nor is there real intimacy. And yet many of us are pouring our sexuality into such activities, where there is no real connection with anyone other than ourselves. In some cases, it is the excitement of the sexual high itself that we crave. In others, we may be using sex to fill a void in our lives, or to achieve a sense of intimacy, or power, or security, or to numb the pain of loneliness, or failure, or an empty life. But the Bible's response to such casual misuse of our sexuality is not merely to say, that's wrong. 
don't do it. You'll get pregnant. You'll go blind. It is to say how incredibly sad to take something as precious and as beautiful as sex and to reduce it to mere physicality. How tragic to take this beautiful garden that God has stocked with every delightful flower and spice and to allow it to be trampled down flat until our hearts become as hard and cold as concrete. What a terrible waste of something that God made so glorious. But the Bible tells us for our sexuality truly to flourish, we not only need relational intimacy, we also need to be legally bonded to that person. Now that point, which is obvious to traditional cultures, is a much harder case to make in Western cultures. Why do we need marriage in order to have sex so long as we have true love? I mean, if I love her and she loves me and we have a great relationship, why do I need a piece of paper to validate that before we sleep together? Why does God care whether you've made a public commitment in marriage before you sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Well, the answer is that there's a crucial difference between a relationship in which you say, I love you right now, and if anything changes, I'll let you know, and a relationship in which you say, I love you and I commit to you forever and ever, in sickness or in health, for now and forever. God designed sex, you see, to operate in a relationship where there is a clear, lasting, lifelong commitment to the other person. Only in that context is there enough, enough safety to let loose the awesome power of your sexuality, which is designed to bond you permanently to that other person. Our sexuality was designed to experience in this safe and loving context, a context analogous to the safety of God's permanent, unbreakable love for us. And if that's true, then even a relationship where you have the legal and the affectionate parts without the sexual is also incomplete. Of course, in every marriage, there are times and seasons when sex has to be put on, on hold. And there may be exceptional cases where sex is just not possible. But as Paul reminds the Corinthians, sexual abstinence should generally just be for a season, not permanent abstinence. St. Augustine's idea of a celibate marriage is a long way from the biblical ideal, in which men and women are intended to find in their spouse's body a garden of passionate delights. And yet many marriages, even good Christian marriages, experience challenges and disappointments in this area. And I would encourage people, if that's their case, to seek help in this area, because sex was meant by God to be a delightful and fun part of that marriage relationship. Indeed, in Song of Songs 8, marriage compa compa the woman compares love to a flaming fire. Not just any fire, but a blaze as intense as the fires of the Almighty Himself. Married love, you see, is not merely comfortable companionship. Otherwise, you could be married to many people at the same time, just as you can have many friends. Married love is much more than just friendship. It is a mutual, exclusive, passionate commitment. It is friendship that is on fire. And it is that aspect of fiery longing in marriage that the Song of Songs brings out so powerfully. The song describes the desire that men and women have to possess a unique, lastingly committed soulmate who will not only be their friend, but their lover. Somebody who is madly and passionately committed to them and to them alone. Marriage is intended to be a flaming, red heart relationship. Now, I would suggest that that is a countercultural expectation. In our culture, we still desire burning passion, but we've largely disconnected marriage from that expectation. Our society's image of marriage, I think, is built around the model of Tevye and Goldie in the movie Fiddler on the Roof. In that movie, reflecting on 25 years of married life, Tevye asks his wife Goldie, do you love me? And in response, she says to him, well, I've washed your clothes, I've cooked your meals, I've cleaned your house, I've shared your bed, I've given you children, I've milked your cow. After 25 years, why do we need to talk about love now? But when he presses the point, but do you love me? She says, 
I suppose I do. That is most people's image of married love. A matter of shared chores rather than shared passion. But the Bible joins those two together and calls us to a marriage that is not just friendship, but friendship on fire. We are not simply meant to say, oh, I suppose I love you, but I love you with a burning love that is as strong as death and as jealous as the grave. We were made for this kind of friendship on fire. Which means if you are still single, the scriptures set a high bar on what you should be looking for in a spouse. Don't just settle for marriage to somebody whose best quality is that they are willing and available. They deserve better than that, and so do you. Only a rich and profound love, only friendship on fire can endure the trials of life in this fallen world. If you love someone enough to marry them, you will inevitably pass with them through the turmoil of sickness, of conflict, of childbirth, or the painful inability to have a child, of many mutual and individual disappointments and brokenness and tears and sorrow, and ultimately, death itself. Marriage is indeed, as those old vows say, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness or in health, till death do us part. And nothing less than friendship on fire will carry you through the difficult times as well as the good. Now, of course, the intensity of that fire will vary over the course of the lifetime. At times, it will be a raging blaze, while at others, it will settle back into glowing embers. At times, you may have to dig through the ashes to find a live coal. Feelings will come and go. But if love is going to endure all things, you need a love that many waters cannot extinguish, a love that floods cannot drown. Now, at this point, many of us are probably feeling considerable guilt and shame because we have not lived up to the calling to this kind of love. Perhaps you have not protected your sexual purity. Your garden has not been locked. Your spring has not been sealed. Or your marriage has not been friendship on fire. Perhaps some have pursued sexual satisfaction outside the context of legal and affectionate relationships. For some people, that struggle may be the addictive use of pornography. For some, that struggle may be same-sex attraction. Some may not technically have had sex, but have done anything and everything else. And that's hardly surprising given the combination of our own desperately fallen natures and the sex-saturated society in which we live and the skill of the evil one in matching temptation to our own personal weaknesses. It's not surprising that we wrestle greatly in these areas. And maybe you think that you're the only one who's wrestled in this way because you've never shared that struggle with anybody else. Well, if so, welcome into the light of God's truth. You're not alone. You are surrounded by many fellow strugglers. We are all part of a band of sexually broken brothers and sisters. But it may be that some of you are perhaps feeling quite proud of your personal purity. Well, if so, it must be because you have forgotten what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount about lust. You may not have engaged in sex physically, but you probably imagined yourself in steamy romantic or sexual relationships in your mind. Or perhaps you've been completely disinterested in sex, which is not necessarily a sign of great holiness, it may simply be a different form of brokenness. There is no one here today who can measure up to this glorious picture of the bride and the groom on their wedding day. Not even one. Nor are matters better for those of us who are married. Scripture calls us to treat your spouse like a seal, which means that he or she is like your most treasured possession, like a pearl of great price. It also suggests that your spouse is meant to leave a lasting imprint on your heart, touching the deepest core of your being. Which of us has really treated our spouse in that way? Do you nurture, cherish, protect with an appropriate jealousy your spouse regarding their highest welfare as your single-minded concern, laying down your life for them daily? Love graciously endures and shares in all things as well as giving itself in grand gestures. And we have not loved our spouses 
in that way. This is why we so desperately need that deeper relationship towards which human marriage was intended to point, the relationship between Christ and his church. You see, the goal of the song is not simply to teach you how to have a great marriage relationship. That might be the subject of a wonderful song, but it's not the subject of the best of all songs. No, this song gives us a glimpse into the heart of the God who himself loves us that passionately. For that reason, all three elements of a great human marriage point to Christ's relationship with us in their own way. To begin with, there is the legal aspect. When Jesus Christ calls somebody to himself, he doesn't simply say, well, I love you for now. Let's see how this works out. And if things are going really well, I'll take you to heaven when you die. No, when God calls somebody to himself, he legally bonds himself. He unites himself to you. Those he calls, he also justifies. And those he justifies, he also sanctifies. And those he sanctifies, he will take to be with himself forever, as Romans 8 reminds us. The security does not... Those whom the Father has given to the Son, nobody can snatch from his hands. The Holy Spirit will enable you to persevere by faith until the very end. When you truly put your faith in Christ, it is a legal bond, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, that not even death can dissolve. But Jesus' relationship with you is not merely legal, it is also deeply affectionate. God is not just stuck with you because he made an unwise commitment that now he just has to see through. He actually loves you. He really does. Hard though that may be for us to grasp sometimes, he knows you inside and out with all of your quirks, all of your failings, all of your sins, and still he loves you personally. God reveals his heart to you on the pages of Scripture and desires that you would come to know and love him in the same way that he already knows and loves you. But God is not merely mildly fond of you in the way that perhaps you are fond of your little brother. What is it about sex that, is it, that, that God intends to add to marriage? Beyond mere companionship, beyond mere friendship, it's fire. Sex is all about deep passion and unique commitments. That's why we crave it so much. Because it persuades us that we matter intensely to somebody. Even in its counterfeit forms, that is the lie that it sells us. A lie that is all the more important, all the more powerful because it is so close to the truth. Love is a flaming fire. And this burning love that we see in our sexuality is a picture of the intensity of the love that God has for you. Nothing less than such an intense, burning love could ever explain the cross. No ordinary love would have been enough to propel the infinite, glorious God of all creation to humble himself to the point of taking on flesh and becoming a mere mortal. Why would the eternal one enter time and take on all of our tiny form? Why would the Holy One enter a sinful world and befriend deeply broken sinners? Burning love. Because of that yearning for us, Jesus Christ bore the frustrations of life in this fallen world where he was constantly surrounded by people who failed him and who let him down, and ultimately, of course, who betrayed him. God's own people, who he had been faithfully wooing throughout the Old Testament, rejected him and chose to have a terrorist released instead of him. And then they conspired with the Romans to nail Jesus to the cross, where he would endure hours of indescribable physical agony and pain. But the worst pain was the spiritual pain of bearing sin, mountains of our sin, your sin, my sin, including all of the sexual sin that we have thought or committed or will think or commit. 
Jews and the Romans weren't the only ones who betrayed Jesus. We have betrayed him too. And we continue to do so day after day after day. Our mountains of sin were laid on his shoulders so that he experienced the burning wrath of his father that scorched his very soul. And what did it cost the father to bruise his son like that? The father was not uncaringly pouring out his wrath on Jesus. Every wound the son received must have caused the father likewise to flinch. Every blow Jesus received was measured out to him by the Father with whom he had shared unbroken fellowship and intimacy since the universe began. What human father could bear the pain of seeing their beloved child suffer like that? What human husband would bear such pain and shame for the sake of his bride? What earthly lover would endure such ignominy for our beloved that have repeatedly shown herself to be so unworthy and so unfaithful. There is not one. There is only one father, only one husband, only one lover who is like that. The God who created us for himself and who will not let us go. The father who now sees us united to his son and delights to gaze upon us with the same intensity that he delights to gaze upon his own son. Jesus Christ, who loved his bride and gave himself for her so that she could be presented to him on their wedding day, pure and spotless, clothed in a righteousness that she didn't earn without spot or blemish. Jesus did not marry us because we're beautiful. He makes us beautiful through the marriage that he has accomplished with us, through the power of his transforming love. This is the God who calls you now to mirror that same intense, burning, committed love in your own relationships. Who calls you to chastity as long as you're unmarried. Chastity in your mind as well as your actions. Who calls you to sexual faithfulness within marriage. Not just abstaining from sex in all of its wrong forms, but properly delighting in sex as the gift it was intended to be. A wonderful gift that you can give your spouse and they can give to you. This is the God who calls you to show to a watching world the kind of permanent, unbreakable, legal bond that is at the same time filled with tender affection and great passion, friendship that is on fire. But Jesus is not just an example of friendship on fire. If Jesus had just come into the, model, into the world to model true friendship and to show us what that kind of life looked like, we would simply be condemned all the more because we are failures. Of friendship on His perfection in being patient, being kind, not keeping a record of wrongs and so on, with people who are so cold and so unresponsive, would simply have highlighted all the more our failure to love in that way. Jesus lived that life for us in our place. Jesus deliberately entered the power of death in our place. Love made the ultimate sacrifice. And for three days, Jesus entered the power of death and love tested itself against that power. And then Jesus Christ, the embodiment of God's love, emerged triumphantly from the grave with his chosen bride, the church, leaning radiantly on his arm. Because Christ is risen, Paul can say, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This incredible, passionate love story is what every page of the Bible is about. God's burning friendship on fire that pursues you right where you are with all of your lostness and brokenness and coldness, with all of your failures to love him and to love others, with all of your sins both outside and inside of marriage and calls you to an exclusive relationship with him, whether for the first time or returning from a far country once again. God delights in your presence in Christ. And it's in that truth, God's victory in Christ over sin and death and hell, that we find the faith to step out again, to show that kind of love to other people around us, to show this burning 
passionate friendship on fire to those God calls us into a marriage relationship with as a picture for the world to see the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which you have loved us in Christ. It is truly friendship that is on fire. It is something quite different from our own marriages. Lord, we pray that, first of all, we would experience that love for ourselves, that whether we are single or married or widowed or divorced, whatever our life situation, we would know your love for us in Christ. And that it would then empower us to go out and live with that kind of life, uh, that kind of love towards others around us. That the world might see what marriage truly was designed to look like and thus be pointed to the Savior who has loved them in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now we're open it up for some questions. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 So the question is that in, uh, in Asian cultures, sex is not publicly talked about in the way that it is in the Bible. Is that a challenge to our culture? Uh, I think uh, in every culture, the things that the Bible affirms and the thing, there are things that uh, the Bible challenges. Uh, and in different cultures, the things that are affirmed and challenged will be different. Um, uh, one th the Song of Songs does talk about sexuality, but it talks about it in very restrained ways. Uh, you know, I, I used to think, uh, before I really studied the song, because this is what people said, that it's full of all this talk about sex, but it's all beautifully presented in metaphors and images uh, that, that handle it with the appropriate delicacy that the subject deserves. There's nothing crass about the way the, way the Bible talks about sex or about sexuality. Um, so, uh, yes, I think the Bible does challenge our cultures to speak more about sex. Uh, I think one of the reasons the Song of Songs is in the Bible is to encourage people to preach about that. Uh, and obviously that requires us then to talk about it. Um, but it does so in a way that is, that is never uh, simply crass or, uh, you know, in the way that, that very often I, I think people in other cultures who talk about sex all the time uh, don't respect the, the, the beauty and, and the specialness of it, which I think the song really does. And so I think, yeah, I think it challenges the way all of us uh, talk, talk or don't talk about sexuality just in different ways. Uh, and I think one of the benefits of studying the song is it forces us to, to ask that question. Uh, how, how do we need to think differently about our sexuality from the way that, that we've learned from our culture or from our family of origin uh, and to, to be challenged by, by the Bible to think about it differently? Um, you know, I, I don't think that ancient Hebrew society talked about sex a great deal, you know, um, but, I, but they did talk about it some, uh, and not just in the song, you also see it in, in Proverbs. You know, you see the father instructing his son, you know, delight in, in the wife of your youth, let her breast satisfy you all the days of your life, don't, you know, don't pour out your fountain in the public, public squares. Um, again, it, it's, it, it, it talks about uh, sexuality within the family because that's an important subject. You know, fathers should be talking to their sons and mothers should be talking to their daughters. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think it's, it's really important that we have those conversations to give people a bit of understanding. Because if we don't try and have the view sure, talk about it, the Bible encourages us to, I think. Yes. Right. Uh, 
familiar with that kind of uh, expressive, you can express our love for red houses and the like you think. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so we think. Well, I, you know, you ask me if I love you. Well, well, I, you know, I, I, I wash your clothes and I take care of you, and so that's love, right? Uh, I, I think it, it is, in, and, and I think British people are somewhat like like this, right? Um, and uh, yeah. So, so uh, my wife is American, and so when we got married, there was a the big difference in our cultures, uh, and that caused some challenges for us. So, uh, so in my family, uh, uh, when when we like a meal that has been cooked for us. You know, we would say that's nice, but in my wife's family, you know, when when you cook for her father, uh, whatever you have cooked, it is the most amazing meal that anybody has ever e eaten. Even even if you just sliced up a watermelon for my wife, so what she heard what she heard was you hate it, um, and so I needed to learn to communicate into that culture. Um, and I think I think the song of songs does challenge us uh, that that the marriage relationship is meant to be more than just that. There is supposed to be this element of fire that's there, uh, and that's something I think we need to learn from from other cultures. Now, it's not just fire, right? I mean, so uh, and 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 in other cultures, fire has been separated from marriage, and so Hollywood movies. There's all that passion and fire, but there's no marriage. You never see married people who are passionately in love with each other. Um, what the Bible does is it puts those things together in a unique way. We done better than you because when you say that's fine, it's very positive. Right, yes. Yeah. It's positive, you say not bad. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but one of the things I've, I've learned from my wife is, is how to praise what is good. Um, you know, in, in the Bible, there is lot, you know, there's lots of affirmation of things that are good. We, we should. Praise whatever you know, whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is lovely. We should praise those things. We should affirm them, and and that's something I've learned from from American culture. There's something very good about that. Right. 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 So, how does the lady know if it's Mr. Right? Well, there are a number of uh, there are a number of biblical ways you see people acquiring wives for for, for people and figuring out that that question, um, uh, and some of them are better than others. Um, one of the 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 uh, the best examples I think you have is uh, is Abraham's servant, uh, who Abraham sends off to find a wife uh, for for Isaac, uh, and so when he uh, when he arrives at the well, which is the place you go to meet women because the women will go and collect the water there, he prays and he asks God to send him uh, a woman who is uh, who is going to water his his animals, uh, and so what that's just as a random test. As if he says, okay, so the next young lady who comes along, let her be the one. It's a test of character, right? Combined with prayer. And I think for, for both men and women, what we should be looking for is, is, is that character and, and bathing the whole process in prayer. We should be asking the Lord, lead me to the person you have for me. Uh, but then we should also have our eyes open that you know, we, we evaluate, right? Uh, is this a personal character? Is this somebody who... Uh, you know who serves me in a good way, uh, who lead. You know who's, uh, who, if, you're, if the woman is looking for somebody who's a spiritual leader, is he going to be a spiritual leader? Um, is he is he responsible? Uh, so you're looking for that for that that character combined with you know. So just not some magical prayer. You know, please send me this person and let me just magically know. The way in which God leads us often is helping us to discern somebody's character, uh, and that's that's what we're looking for. Somebody. Uh, who's you know who loves the Lord? Who, uh, who who we are you know we we are better together with them than we are apart, uh, and uh, whose whose life seems to be running in in, uh, in a parallel track with ours, and and that's what we should be trying to discern through that 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 process of of figuring out is this the, is this the right person? You know we should be not just having fun together. We should be having the kind of conversations where we ask the questions that help us get the answers to those things.
Uh, you know, what, 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 do you, what is the Lord's leading on your life? You know, so if he feels called to, as a missionary to far away and, and you feel like you need to live within 10 miles of your parents, you know, that doesn't look like, you know, the, the Lord's calling you together, right? Because if the Lord's calling you together, he's going to call you to the same place. Um, and uh, so you're looking for a dovetailing of, of your lives together, but you're also looking for character. Um, that's, you know, that's important. Um, not, not a project, you know, somebody to, to redeem and fix, uh, but somebody who's, who's walking with the Lord. Marriage is tough enough with, you know, with personal character, you know, because we're sinners and they're sinners, um, so we don't want to make it harder than it has to be. <laughs> hmm, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you.